Okay? So, if, if the Fed believes that there is inflation in the economy, okay, theoretically it would raise the discount rate. And that would prompt banks to raise their interest rates. And now you, faced with higher prices for borrowing money, are less likely to buy on credit. That takes money out of the economy. Credit is a big chunk of the money supply. In fact, it's a bigger chunk of the money supply in the United States than in almost all other developed countries. Americans buy a lot of stuff on credit. Okay. If the Fed believes that there is recession, then it would lower the discount rate. And that would, in turn, cause banks to lower their interest rates, prompting you to buy on credit, putting money out there in the economy, stimulating the economy. Okay, so again, it's a very straightforward, very theoretically at least, the devil is always in the details, right? But theoretically, it's very straightforward. It makes a lot of common sense, doesn't it? If there is inflation, what will the Fed do with the discount rate? Arguably, what would the Fed do? If there is inflation, if there's too much demand, what does the Fed want to do? It wants to suppress demand. So how can it suppress demand? Take money out of the economy. How can it take money out of the economy? Raise the discount rate, because that would probably mean that banks would in turn do what? Or other lending institutions would do what? Raise interest rates on loans that they charge or that they, that they take out with consumers and businesses. Right? If there is recession, the Fed would lower the discount rate. Lending institutions would lower their interest rates in turn, and that would make it more attractive for you to buy on credit. That's the theory. Okay? Does that make sense? Questions, comments? What is that little beep? Where's that coming from? Is that construction out in the hallway again? What is that? No, it's just our, it's just our passing period. Oh, okay. Never heard that before. All right, uh, questions about that? Now, monetary policy is not without its criticisms as well. Remember I told you that the monetarists favor monetary policy because they think that there are too many problems associated with fiscal policy. But that doesn't mean that monetary policy is perfect or that it's without problems. One problem that monetary policy has is that it also there are also time lags associated with monetary policy, although they're not as great as the lags that are associated with fiscal policy. There are still time lags, and sometimes they can be quite significant. The amount of time that it takes to recognize economic conditions and for the Fed to decide on a monetary policy response, and then particularly for the effects to kick in. Take the Great Recession. I mean, look, if the economy is in, in you know, a very severe economic situation like 2008, 2009, 2010, the Fed, what, by the way, what should the Fed have done during that period with the discount rate? Should have lowered it. Should have lowered the discount rate, and banks should have followed suit and lowered interest rates. Do you think that happened during that period, 2008, 2009, 2010? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, it did, <laughs> right? The Fed kept lowering the discount rate, lowering the discount rate, lowering the discount rate, lowering the discount In fact, it ultimately got down practically to zero. In fact, it's still practically at zero, okay? And Lending institutions lowered their interest rates, lowered their interest rates. How about mortgage rates? Anybody know? Is it just in terms of the home, in terms of home mortgage rates? Is it has it been a good time to buy a house over this period or a bad time? Just in terms of the mortgage rate. If you're in the market to buy a house during this period, are you getting a good deal or are you getting a bad deal? Do you think mortgage rates should be high during this period or low during this period? Low. low. 
very, very, very low. <laughs> very low. Very low mortgage rates. Okay? It's just the interest rate for a home loan, right? So the Fed kept lowering the discount rate until it got to practically zero. And uh, I think that's, you know, the lesson here that I'm trying to suggest to you is that the Fed would lower the discount rate and wait to see, you know, if the economic effects would kick in and the desired economic effects didn't kick in. So they lowered the discount rate again. Wait, 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 wait for the effects. The lag's got to kick in. Never kicked in, right? Lower it again, lower it again, that sort of pattern until ultimately it got down to about zero. Now, do you think that ordinary folks pay attention to what the Fed does? You think people like who want to buy a new house or who might be thinking about buying a new car or anything on credit, do you think that they care or pay attention to what the Fed does? Does the news media report on the Fed and what it may or may not do? Yes, it does. And at people, yes, people, abs you may not, in your life, it may not seem relevant right now, but someday it will. People do pay attention. Okay. Last September, there was a meeting of the Open Market Committee of the Fed. That's the body that actually makes decisions about the discount rate. And there was a lot of speculation going into that September meeting that the Fed would finally raise the discount rate. It had been a long, long time, practically zero, practically zero. It had been a long, long time since the Fed had raised the discount rate. And so maybe it was time. But also maybe the Fed perceived that there was some inflationary pressure starting to build. And the Fed is determined never to let inflation be, be a problem again, like it was back in the 1970s. So there was lots and lots of speculation that the Fed would raise the discount rate in September. It didn't do that. It left it the same. And now the Fed is about to go into its December meeting the open market committee and the media starting to report on what the Fed, it's a lot of speculation out there, projections that, well, okay, the Fed finally will raise the discount rate. We'll see. We'll see. It's actually, this is relevant because it points to another one of the problems associated with monetary policy. So I want you to think very carefully about what I'm about to tell you. Okay? If people pay attention to what the Fed does, Okay. Let's say that you're in the market to buy a new car, okay. and you're going to finance that car because you don't just pay cash for a car, okay. like most people don't just pay cash for a car. So you're going to finance this car, but you hear reports in the news media that the Fed's worried about possible inflation in the economy, and so at the next open market committee, next open market committee meeting, they are likely to raise the discount rate. Might that affect your behavior? What might that prompt? Denise, Denise is shaking her head yes. Denise, what might that prompt you to do? Wait. Really? That's going to make you wait? Well, they raise the discount rate. No, look, here, we're in November, okay? Let's imagine that it's not November 30th. Let's imagine that it's November the 15th, let's say. And you're thinking very seriously about buying a new car, but you thought, well, maybe I'll wait till the end of the year, okay? But then you hear these news reports that the Fed is going to meet, the Open Market Committee is going to meet in December. And it looks very likely that the Fed will raise the discount rate. What might that prompt you to do? To wait? That's going to make you wait? So that you'll have an even higher interest rate? I guess not. It might prompt you to actually buy now so that you can lock in a lower interest rate, right? Okay, so if that's the case, then, and are there other people out there like you who are weighing the decision about whether to buy something on credit, and they think that interest rates may be going up in the near future, they might actually go ahead and buy now. That puts a lot more money out there in the economy right now, which the Fed is already worried about inflation, right? You follow the, what I'm saying to you? So 
it could be that monetary policy is counterproductive if the Fed, the central, where in the United States we call the central bank the Fed. In other countries they have central banks as well. But if the central bank, if the Fed in this country is too predictable about what it might do, okay, people will actually change their behavior. Okay? There's actually a theory that won an economist a Nobel Prize a, few, a number of years ago called Rational Expectations Theory. And what that says is that people like you and I are rational The conference is about to end. We're all rational creatures. And when we make decisions, we weigh the costs and benefits. And we make the decision that we think serves our self-interest, that produces the most net benefit. So Denise here, she's thinking about buying a car, okay? And she, she's very, very worried because she thinks that if she waits till the end of the year like she had planned on doing, she may be facing a higher rate of interest and it's going to cost her more money to buy this car. So she goes ahead and pulls the trigger now and buys the car, okay? And that makes the inflation problem even worse. Not Denise by herself, but all the people like Denise, who do something that they wouldn't otherwise do because their rational expectations tell them that the Fed is about to do something, they better lock in the lower interest rate. Okay? So in order for this to work, so goes rational expectations theory, this Nobel Prize winning theory. In order for monetary policy to work, you have this inherent problem that people, if the Fed's too predictable, that people will change their behavior. Okay? So in order for this to work, the Fed has to throw us a curveball every once in a while. It has to trip us up and make us think that it's going to do something and then it actually doesn't do it. And I suspect that may be what happened in September when everybody was predicting that the Fed would raise the discount rate, but it just left it alone. There may, be, there may have been other economic reasons for that as well, but I think at least part of it may be that the Fed said, no, well, it's a soap people, so we trick people. Okay, good. You see, because what they want, they don't want people to do things that they wouldn't do otherwise if it wasn't for the policy, because that makes it count. That's what economists mean by policies being inefficient. Monetary policy is inefficient if it, if it provides you with an incentive to do something that you wouldn't do otherwise. It's like the tax code. Many economists are convinced that our tax code is inefficient because there are all these incentives embedded in the tax code that prompt people to do things that they wouldn't do otherwise. Tax credits, tax exclusions, uh, you know, uh, tax deductions and so on cause people to go, you know, you might, I'll show you how inefficient it is. If we didn't have all of these, you know, tax deductions and tax credits and so on and tax, you might calculate your taxes yourself. If it was very straightforward and very simple, you might just do it yourself. But in order to take care of, uh, to take uh, advantage of all those deductions and incentives and credits and all that sort of stuff, instead you turn it over to an account and say to the account, get me all the get me all the good stuff you can get me. Right? That's inefficient according to economic theory, because it's prompting you to do something that you wouldn't do otherwise. That's why many economists prefer a you know, do it away with all those deductions and exclusions and credits and stuff. And ideally, uh, many economists argue uh, doing away with the income tax altogether and replacing it with what they call a head tax where everybody just pays, you know, a lump sum. After all, if you're taxing income, they argue, people have an incentive to hide income, okay? which is in itself inefficient. Okay, we're out of time. We did